Hi, in this lecture I'm going to talk about the energy that is associated with rotational motion and the so-called rotational kinetic energy and I'm going to go through some examples of um, its applications. So right now the system I want us to imagine is maybe something like this where I imagine there's some pivot point here and there are a bunch of point masses um, that are that are attached in some way to this to this point here. So I've drawn the different radii. That doesn't mean that this object really has to look like there's a straight connection here that could be hooked up by some other you know connection to that. And the important part is that you imagine only those masses sitting in those spots are relevant. Um, and this whole system is rotating around this point here as this, the center of rotation with a angular velocity omega. So that means each object is each each mass is following a circular path. So for example this one here would be going along a path sort of like this and then all the way around. This one here would be going along, along a path like this. This one here would be going along a path like this and of course all the way around right the, each one is is traveling. So this one might have a velocity, it's called V1 that's this way. This would have a velocity V2 in this direction. It's going to be a bit bigger than this one. The speed of this one's bigger than this one because, of course, it takes the same amount of time to get round, um, but this one's traveling along a bigger circle, right? V is omega times R, and if R2 is bigger than R1, then this one's going to go faster. This one right now would be doing something like this, and this one might be doing something like this. I just chose four masses, could have chosen just one, or a hundred, or a million, it doesn't matter. So let's write down what I just said. The, this, the velocity of each one, um, or rather the speed I should say, is it's just omega and it's the same because it's a rigid body right it's rotating as in one piece they're not individual um, planets orbiting they're all connected just the whole thing is rotating as one omega times r1 is this one here v2 is omega times r2 um, and so on right same for v3 and v4 Okay, so let's just write down the total kinetic energy of the system. And I'm not going to invent some new kinetic energy here. I'm just going to apply the, the, the kinetic energy that we know about, um, the half mv squared. And I'm going to try to re-express that in terms of the rotational um, properties of the system. So the kinetic energy, right, is going to be a half mv squared. I've got four objects here, so it's a half m1 v1 squared plus a half m2 v2 squared plus, and then so on. Get the other two, right? A half m3 v3 squared, a half m4 v4 squared. Now. Each of those speeds, right, I can express them in terms of omega and the radius. So let's do that. Get one half m1 r1 squared omega squared. Right. I just picked the r first um, for convenience in a second. Plus one half m2. Now r2 squared omega squared. Same omega, right, but different mass, different r plus, you get the idea, a half m3, r3 squared, omega squared, and so on. So because the omega is the same, the half is the same, I can factor those out. So I'm going to get a half, and I'm going to get m1, r1 squared, plus m2, r2 squared, plus the other two, m3, r3 squared, and m4, r4 squared, times omega squared, and now if you look carefully, you recognize this thing in the middle, each mass times its radius squared. What does that make? That is, of course, nothing 
but the moment of inertia of the system. Right, m r squared, that is the moment of inertia of one of, of one of the point masses. Just add them, you get a total moment of inertia. So what we've shown is that the kinetic energy is one half i omega squared um, for this particular system, but of course this generalizes. It generalizes because any rigid body, I can imagine, is being made up of lots of tiny masses. So this generalizes. All right. For example, if I have some some say solid object like this, some kind of you know piece of wood or something with a funny shape and it's pivoting around here, but I can imagine splitting this up into lots of little point masses, and for each one, I can get an R R. Uh, essentially the same thing I did up here for 4, I might do for a 1,000 there, or mathematically I might actually do it for an infinite number of infinitesimally small um, mass chunks that make up this, this um, board, say, um, as a whole. In that case, my sum would of course become an integral, like an infinite sum of infinitesimally small chunks but it doesn't change any of this algebra. Right? So any solid object still can be calculated in exactly the same way, except maybe that finite sum of four masses might become a finite sum of a thousand tiny chunks, or if you want to be um, precise to the to with infinite precision or any measurement error at all and no, um, no approximations, then I might say that um, I'm going to take an integral over an infinite number of tiny little chunks, but nothing along here changes in terms of the algebra, except this expression here inside those, those brackets is an integral, but an integral, again, is nothing but the integral that gives you the moment of inertia for any kind of extended object. So what you see here is that this expression, a half i omega squared, it's really just a kind of translation of this dictionary that we've already developed. We say the mass in linear and translational motion um, becomes I, V becomes omega. I'm not saying they're equal, that would be nonsense, right? We know how to calculate I from a bunch of tiny masses on sticks, for example. But in terms of what the relationships are between the quantities, this looks like a half mv squared. Right, and in we had f equals m a, and then torque equals um, i times alpha. So, so this sort of dictionary, right, of how those quantities are related, it includes the kinetic energy. Okay, fair enough. Um, now, what about a situation where the system as a whole is not only rotating, but is also moving sideways. So maybe a rolling ball might be a good example of that. How can I deal with the energy then? Because then the motion of any one of those chunks would be made up of the motion of the thing as a whole moving sideways and the rotational motion. So let's, let's have a look at that situation. So I'm not going to prove this in full generality. I'm just going to imagine a very simple object that is rotating and moving sideways. So well, let's ask first, what about if there is a combination of rotational and translational motion? So I'm just going to do an example that illustrates the point, and then the, the proof um, will generalize. So my claim is 
that the total kinetic energy is just the kinetic energy um, of the translation plus the kinetic energy of the rotation. Now you might say it's obvious that it has to be the case, but, but it's not obvious. Because if I say I have an, um, take a very simple object. Let's imagine I have an object that is nothing but two masses, and let's make them the same mass, like same value of mass. I'm um, like this. Let's imagine this thing is a, as a whole is moving to the right with some velocity v. Now, if this thing is moving to the right, but in addition, this thing here is it's spinning with some um, angular velocity omega, then the motion of this one like is moving to the right, but it's also moving left and down. What if I find a half mv squared by adding those two, those two velocity vectors, right? It's moving to the right, but I add to it a vector of its, its, um, its tangential motion um, around the, the circle due to the rotation. But it becomes, it seems to become rather more complicated. Is this guaranteed? Will it prove that it is in fact the case? So um, let me call this this velocity of this object as a whole the this the velocity of the center of mass, right? So and because the this is neither the velocity of this one nor the velocity of this one, because they both include a component of the velocity that it's due to the rotation. Um, let me call it the velocity of center of mass, right? So this point here is moving sideways and and then it's spinning at the same time. And let's say this is radius r, radius r. Of course, the center of mass is going to be exactly in the middle between those two because we assume they're the same mass just for simplicity to kind of illustrate our point. Um, let me label, label these. Let's say this is, this is a and this is b. So let's figure out what is the actual velocity of a and b. So... Um, it depends, of course, what part of the rotation they're in. Like, are they at that angle? Are they at that angle? It's going to change. Um, so let me call this, this the vertical. Um, let me call this angle here theta. Then, and let me call this, um, this direction, the x-axis, this the y-axis. So choosing my axis so that the center of mass only moves in the x direction. Again, that's a choice I can make because I can choose my coordinate system any way I want and I'm making a choice that will make my life algebraically easier. So let's write down the velocity of this one. Well, it has an x and a y component. So I'm going to write VA x, the x component of VA. That's going to be equal to well, the motion of the whole thing, because that's in the x direction, and then it's going to the to the left, right? Because it's it's spinning spinning like this, but its um, its speed along the circle is omega r. But of course, I only want the x component. It's going to be omega r cosine of the angle. And you can check that, right? So, so this part here is the overall motion. This part here is how much this is moving um, to the left and down. If I'm following this, like if you imagine I have my camera and I'm following the motion of this along, then the speed that I see it having on screen, that is what I mean by that, right? In this case, it would be in negative direction. The x component would be negative direction, um, omega r times the cosine of this angle. You can check that the geometry works out. Um, then it's it's y velocity. In the y direction, this one doesn't contribute. Um, but in this case, it, it would be uh, minus omega r sine theta. Again, you can check that that is in case true by taking the, the y component of this this direction here. 
this velocity here. And then the same thing or a similar thing I can write down for the other object, the object B, dx is equal to, well, d, how fast is the thing moving as a whole, that's the x direction. And right now the way I have to find it, right, this angle is also theta, but it, this is, it, its rotation is adding, it's adding here with the positive direction uh, because it's moving faster to the right than it would be if it wasn't rotating. The, the motion of the rotation adds to the motion of the, the overall object. It's omega uh, cosine theta the plus here because the rotation makes it go to the right in addition to the overall motion to the right. And then dby is just plus because it's going up omega r sine theta. And again, you want to double check that you see how those components come about sine cosine in the right places. So let's use those then now to find the, um, the kinetic energy of this. Well, it's going to be one half m v a squared plus one half m v b squared. Total kinetic energy of two masses. I can write this as one half m. I can can I can sorry I can factor out the m as a whole, right? And then I can split my v a squared into v a x and v a y. So we have v a x squared plus v a y squared. Um, there's no z direction here. And then the same for, for B. Because of course, the, the speed squared, right, the way you'd calculate that from components in the first place is by just adding the squares. And if I want the speed itself, I take the square root. But here we, we don't have to take the square root because we want the squared quantity. Um, so now we can plug in, right, we've got expressions for each of those. So let's plug those in going to get one half m. Now, I want to plug this in, I want to square it, so I'm going to get this squared minus twice this times this plus this squared, right? I'm squaring a minus b squared is a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So I'm going to get v center of mass squared minus 2v center of mass omega r cosine theta plus omega squared r squared cosine squared theta. So that is just this thing squared, right? I've just written this term. Now I'm going to add this term here. That one's easier because there's only one thing here. So it's plus omega squared r squared sine squared theta. Right, just squaring this, the minus gets squared away. And then I'm going to do the same thing for x, for sorry, for b, x, and v, b, y. So I'm going to get plus this term again, this time from squaring this here, and plus 2 v, c, o, m, omega, r, cosine theta, it's a cross term, plus omega squared r squared cosine squared theta, so that's this one done. Now I've just got to add this one here, the last one. That's plus omega squared r squared sine squared theta. All right. So we can simplify this significantly. Namely, this one is going to cancel with this one. Let me color code this so we don't get lost in our algebra. So minus 2v omega r cosine theta plus 2v uh, omega r cosine theta. So this, those two, are going to cancel out. And then, of course, I can use the fact that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Right. So now use sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. I'm going to do it twice, once here, once here. Um, and so what do I get? I get 1 half m. I get twice this one, right? 
And then I get cosine squared sine squared is 1, and then the same thing again. So I get twice uh, omega squared r squared. All right, what am I going to do with this one? Well, I'm just going to rewrite this as twice 1 half m Um, 1 half m times v center of mass squared plus 1 half m r squared omega squared. Now you can hopefully already see that that just means I've got the linear um, kinetic energy plus, this is i, Write this together, m r squared, i of one of the balls, plus half i omega squared. That kind of proves our point. That's two because we've got two of them, right? Each one has that much linear kinetic energy. Each one has that much rotational kinetic energy. So we've kind of proved our point that, indeed, I can just add those, even when, strictly speaking, this one right now is moving a bit more slowly because it, the whole thing goes to the right, but it's rotating to the left, and this one goes a bit faster um, because it's moving to the right, but also it's rotating to the right. But that effect cancels out in the end. The total energy is exactly the same as just treating the rotational energy and the translational energy entirely separately and adding. This was our proof, at least for this system. That's the kinetic energy, um, translational kinetic energy, plus the rotational kinetic energy, exactly what we try to show. Now you can try it for a different system, you can try it in full generality for a rigid body. Um, in the end, you're going to follow a similar, similar sort of derivation. It might involve an integral if you have a rigid body, where you have to split it into an infinite number of tiny mass chunks. Um, but the principle, again, of this, this sort of illustration of this claim up here, um, that, that stays the same. All right, now we just have to apply this to a bunch of situation, situations to see how, um, how it works in practice. So here's the first example I want to look at. That is an object that is rolling down a hill. Now, what do I mean by object? Well, an object, it could be a ball could be a cylinder, like a solid cylinder. It could be could be a hollow pipe, kind of a, a hollow cylinder. It could also be a bike. Um, if it's a bike, then when I calculate the rotational kinetic energy, I would of course only take into account the parts of the bike that are actually rotating, namely the, the wheels. But in all cases, I'm going to proceed the same way. The only thing that changes, if I make a different choice here, is the moment of inertia. Each has a different moment of inertia, MOI. But otherwise... Nothing changes. Right. Now, what is the moment of inertia of each one of those? Well, for some of them, we've actually worked it out. Like a pipe is pretty much like a ring, except it's stretched long, but doesn't change anything. A cylinder is like a disc. A bicycle is like, you know, two wheels, like two rings, I suppose, uh, to a good approximation. Um, a ball, we haven't really calculated that yet. It's a little bit harder. Um, but again, it's, um, you can just look up the answer. Or you can, if you've done a multivariable calculus, you may be able to actually do that calculation yourself. Figure out what the moment of inertia is by integrating using um, spherical polar coordinates. If you've done that. Otherwise, just look it up. All right. So let's work out 
Um, it helps use energy conservation to find the speed at the bottom. We assume we're going to start at with speed zero. Now, in the past, without rotations, you might just say, okay, potential energy here plus zero kinetic is no potential energy here plus unknown kinetic. You figure out the unknown kinetic energy um, and you're going to find the, um, the speed. So we're going to do exactly the same thing, except we have to take into account the, the rotational um, kinetic energy. So energy at top, let's make a little table. Um, we want we want the, the kinetic translational, that's the normal kinetic one, then the rotational kinetic energy, and then we've got of course the gravitational potential energy, because gravity is the relevant interaction here that accelerates the, the object in the first place. Squish this in a bit, just give myself a bit more room, it'll be okay. So initially this is zero, this is zero because it's not rotating yet, and this one is, um, now the object has a mass m, I should have written this down, I think it's obvious, m, g, h, where I'm defining my zero line to be down here, I think that's the sensible choice. Of course you can choose any height as your zero height, that just will change, you'll just be adding or subtracting the same number um, on both sides, so there's no effect in your answer. I'm making this my zero height. And then energy at the bottom the bottom I mean back here it's going to be one half m v squared one half i omega squared and the gravitational potential energy down here is zero so the total right the totals are equal so I'm going to get that um, one half m v squared plus one half i omega squared is equal to m g h. Right? I'm not saying kinetic equals potential that'll get into trouble. I'm saying total initially equals total final. It just happens to work out that there's no kinetic energy at the beginning and no potential at the end. But that is the logic here. I'm not by default setting kinetic equals potential. That's a common mistake. If we already had a little bit, little bit of velocity here, we would have taken that into account and this would not be zero. Okay. Um, now this seems to have two unknowns. As V and omega, we don't know either one. We assume M and I are known. So v and omega though they're related right if this thing is rolling and we're assuming it rolls without slipping and without sort of sliding at the same time um, then for one rotation the object moves by one circumference like imagine i put sort of paint on this and i roll it by the time one point has moved all the way around like it's gone to say here the the distance it has traveled is equal to the circumference. So what does that mean? V is 2 pi r times omega. What? Crazy. No. Sorry. What am I saying? Oh, r times omega. So 2 pi is the distance traveled for one full rotation. Um, but omega, of course, is the... Um, is, is the number of radians per second by which it turns, not the number of full rotations per second. 2 pi f times r would be another way of writing this. Alright, so I can plug this in here, because I want v, in this case, right, I asked for v, I don't care about omega, so I can eliminate all omega here. I'm going to get 1 half m v squared plus 1 half i, and then v squared over r squared, right, I'm plugging v over r in for omega, um, that is equal mgh, 
and now I can, can simplify this. Now I is going to be proportional to the mass. Like for any object so far we've met, I is always some fraction times m times r squared. Like it has to be by dimensional analysis. So if you actually decide on an object, you can plug in, you know, if it's say the um, the pipe, it's just mass times r squared, then you could actually cancel out the m's. It's going to be true of any other object too, except the fraction in front of the expression for the moment of inertia is going to be different. Um, but so in practice, you'll always be able to cancel out the m. It's reassuring because gravity um, pulls all masses with the the same resulting acceleration comes um, so the mass should cancel out always if gravity is the only relevant force acting. Um, but let's just rearrange it in the form that it is in. So what are we going to get? Um, I guess I'm going to do this long-winded way. We're going to get one half times m plus i over r squared. You can tell this has units of mass. V squared is m g h and so v squared is going to be 2 m g h divided by m plus i over r squared. For the crucial piece of information we needed in this calculation in addition to pure energy conservation is this relationship between the speed of the thing and the rate of rotation and that is assuming it's not sliding. Now you can always check, does, is this answer a sensible answer? Well, what if the object is not rotating, if it's a sled? You make this zero, and you're going to get back to GH. That is hopefully an, a, a result that you remember from your earlier mechanics course, of something going down a hill, um, or just falling. So, so that at least is some um, plausibility check of our answer, right? If i is zero, or if the object is not rotating at all, we're going to get back v squared equals 2gh h, like we know and love from um, linear mechanics. All right, that was the first example. Let's now look at another example. So here's a drawing of the second example I want to discuss. I imagine a kind of pulley system where I have maybe a table and there's a there's a pulley wheel here um, and there's a, there's a cord or a rope, a string of some kind that's connecting the mass up here and the mass down there. Put an M1 and M2. I've decided to give them some values too so we can actually do a numerical calculation. So we're going to plug those in right at the end. And the pulley itself. Now what about the pulley itself? In the past, when you had a situation like this, it probably told you you have a light pulley. Light meaning you can ignore the mass. You can ignore its moment of inertia. It's you can ignore its rotational kinetic energy. It's too small to matter. Well, now we're going to assume that's no longer true. Let's say it's a heavy pulley. And by heavy, I just mean it's heavy enough that you can't ignore it. So I'm going to call the mass of this pulley m, it's like lowercase m. I'm going to say it's one kilogram, and um, we plug in values at the end. And I'm going to suppose its radius is 0.2 meters. So we can right away write down its, um, its moment of inertia. It's a disk. So its moment of inertia is going to be one half m r squared, that's something we derived previously. So if I want to get a numerical value for it, r squared would be 0 0.04 and 0 0.02 times 1 um, kilogram meter squared. Not a big number, but what does it even mean, not a big number? Right? It might be big in relation to everything else that's going on in the system, it's certainly going to be relevant. Okay, so our goal is to find the impact speed of this mass. Now, 
We're going to use energy to do that. If you wanted to find the time it takes to get from here to here, you could not use energy. Um, you'd have to find the acceleration, you analyze it in terms of forces, tension, weight, tension here, um, the torque on the pulley, right? You could do that too. It's a very good example to actually work through. Find the acceleration of this. We are not going to do that. We only care about the impact speed it has at the bottom. But you can do the other calculation where you are finding the acceleration using torque and forces and so on. So by all means, go away and do it. And that would allow you to calculate the time it takes from here to here, um, which we can't use energy for because energy is conserved in time. So it can't possibly tell you anything about how long something takes. All right, so let's work this out. Let's use energy. Um, what energies do we have? Well, initially, right, we only have gravitational potential energy. I guess we should actually we can't do this until I actually specify a height here. Could have done this before. Um, let's call this height h, and we're going to say it's 0 0.8 meters um, when we plug in values later. So initially, there's no kinetic energy. This thing isn't spinning. Those things aren't moving. So all you have is gravitational potential energy. So total energy at start is going to be equal to um, m1gh. Write down zero kinetic, just so I, I know I've um, kept track. If I look back at my calculation later, I get confused. Oh, did I forget kinetic energy? Oh no, it just happens to be zero. Now, what about the gravitational potential energy of this mass here? I mean, it's high up, isn't it? It's true. I could write down a value here, maybe if I'd know the height of the table. But I know that the gravitational potential energy of this mass is not going to change. So it's okay for me to not include it because it just stays the same, right? It only moves, uh, only moves horizontally. If this system were with this surface like, at an angle, okay, then it would be a different story. Then we would have to include that. Again, that's a fun problem you can solve. Perhaps it's a problem that appears on your exam. Who knows? So you better practice. All right. So, so what is the um, total energy on impact? Could write at the end, but what does that even mean? Let's be precise. The instant this mass hits the ground. Well, I'm going to have zero gravitational potential energy because by calling this m1gh, I've implicitly defined the ground to be zero height. Again, I think we agree that's a fairly sensible choice. Um, the total energy impact, therefore, is all kinetic. Now, what's moving? This thing is moving this thing is moving, and this thing is moving, and this thing is spinning. So those two have linear kinetic energy, and I have to include both. This one has um, rotational kinetic energy. So I'm going to have m1, sorry, 1 half m1 times v squared. v is my impact speed. I'm not going to put a subscript on it, because there's only one velocity in all of Um, and then I'm going to add to it the second object, one half m two v squared. Now, are those the same? Yes, they are, because if this one's moving down at one meter per second and this one's moving across at one meter per second, the string does not stretch or you know significantly change its length. Um, at least that's could have stated that assumption more clearly at the beginning, but I mean, it would we would have been told right if if the string had some elastic properties. And if the pulley were light, we'd be done. That's it. You said those equal, you solve. Um, but in our case, the pulley is rotating. So we have to include it. So it's going to be one half i, i being the moment of inertia of the pulley, times, let me actually put a p here for pulley. So we, we don't get confused later. Is there some other moment of inertia? I mean, it's the only one. But you know, you never know when you come back to your notes, um, how much of it you remember. 
So it's this times what? Times omega squared. Now what is omega? It's the rate of rotation of this one here. How many radians per second um, is this wheel is this wheel rotating by? Now omega is of course related to the speed with which the string runs across the pulley. Again we're going to assume the string does not slide. That means one meter of string moves along past the pulley, well then the, the circumference of the, the pulley is turned by one meter. So this, the, the speed of a point here, the edge of the pulley, is the same as the speed of the rope, the string. So as before, we have that V is omega times R, right? Because if I track a point here, it's moving the same rate as the string. So I can rewrite this as one half m1 plus m2, I'm just going to factorize this, v squared, plus 1 half i p, the moment of inertia of the pulley, times, um, times v squared over, over r squared. Um, why not simplify this further? I'm going to get 1 half times m1 plus m2 plus i p over r squared. Again, can I add those? Yes, I can. They're all masses. So mass, mass, mass meter squared over mass over meter squared means mass. This is units of mass, this fraction, um, times v squared. Right, and here there is there's no... Um, gravitational potential energy because this thing has fallen all the way down to the bottom. At this point I can just rearrange this and plug in numbers um, but let's write down the, the full result. So I'm going to get that V is equal to 2 M1 G H divided by M1 plus M2 plus i p over r squared. Take the square root. Okay, now um, we plug in the values. So m1 was 3 kilogram, m2 was 4 kilogram. We worked out what i p was already, although actually i p over r squared just means a half times the mass, so it's just 0.5. Um, let's plug in the values. We're going to get 2 times 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared. Yes, I know 9.8, but seriously, it's 10. We live on a planet where it rounds to 10. So let's actually take advantage of that convenience. Times height was 0.8 meters. Then we divide this by 3 kilograms plus 4 kilograms. Plus, this was one kilogram, um, sorry, this was one half mr squared. We divide by r squared, one half times one kilogram is 0.5. Five kilograms. Now I wish I'd, um, I'd, I'd worked out the actual value beforehand. Let's figure, let's see if I can do it. Um, six times 10 is um, 60 times 0 0.8. Is, is 48 um, kilogram meters squared per second squared. That's the top of my fraction inside the square root. And the bottom, I've got 7.5 kilograms. Okay, the units already make sense. That's reassuring because kilograms divides kilograms and meters squared per second squared take the square root. I'm going to end up with meters per second. Um, what's What's this? Well, this is going to be 6 point, um, 6 point 4 by my, my, the math in my head, um, square root thereof, meters per second. Now what's the square root of 6.4? It's, it's a little bit over 2.5. I'm just going to write 2.5 and a bit 
meters per second might be closer to 2.6, you can, you can check um, what it actually is. 2.5 squared is 6.25, um, which is slightly less, so um, it's going to be going to be close to 2.5 meters per second. Now, had you not taken into account the pulley, right? Let's imagine this system, the pulley, we ignore the pulley, we don't know about um, moment of inertia, we just ignore it, we pretend it's not there. Well, I would not have included this term, I would not have included this term, so I would have divided by 7, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been that far off, but it would have been a little bit off, and in a real-life situation, um, that might have mattered. All right, we're almost there. Um, let me do just one more example, namely the um, the example of a yo-yo. Before I start that last example, um, I'm going to post a link to another short video in which I do a little demonstration, and that is one that you may also be working with um, in your labs, namely one where there's a mass and it's hanging from a string, and it string unwinds from a wheel that has a certain amount of moment of inertia that may be larger or smaller depending on what wheel you're looking at. So I'll post a link to that um, in the description of this video and you should also find a link to it on your course page. But now let's look at the yo-yo. Here's the setup for our last example, um, the yo-yo. So what is a yo-yo? Hopefully you've played with one before at one point or another, but if you look at it closely, you have essentially instead of an inner um, disc, and around this you're going to wrap a string um, as tight as you can, and then the um, this is kind of the side view where we can see like from this side, say, and then as the yo-yo goes down, the string unwraps, right? But the the yo-yo has to spin for that to happen. Um, and then there's this, this outer, these outer discs that, hit, that, that fundamentally stop the string from falling off, um, but also they add moment of inertia to the system and without changing the radius at which the string is wrapped. And that has interesting um, implications. So unlike, say, a normal, like a, a cylinder around which you wrap a string, where the, the torque is the tension of the string times the radius, here you've got a um, an independently variable radius that allows you to modify the moment of inertia without modifying this radius here. And so in a, in a sense you have like more freedom of making it the system work the way you want it to. Now in this calculation we're going to do, I'm just going to ask how quickly is the yo-yo rotating, like what is its angular velocity, when it reaches the bottom assuming the string is a total length L and it starts completely um, wound up. If I wanted to know what is the um, the acceleration of the yo-yo on its way down, for example, then again I would have to analyze this in terms of forces, in terms of tension up, weight down, um, what is the torque due to the tension, and so on. Again, that's a good example for you to work through. Find the angular acceleration of the yo-yo as it as it unwraps itself, or as it wraps as it moves upwards and wraps itself back back up. Why does it do that? You can think about that too, um, but that might be might work better after we've talked about angular momentum. Anyway, in this calculation, our point is to figure out how quickly is the yo-yo rotating. When it reaches the bottom, that is when it has descended by a length that's equal to L. So again, we're just going to set up energy conservation. At the top, I have M. So let M be the total mass. I'm going to assume that each of those disks has the same mass. That's an assumption. It's a simplification. In general, that's not true, but it'll make my life easier. I'm going to say the total mass M here is just 3M, but if it were different, you know how to calculate total mass. So I, again, I turn gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. So I have mgl. So that's the height, um, the initial height compared to the to the, the height at the bottom. That is going to be equal to one half i 
omega squared plus one half the total mass times v squared. Now, what is i? i is the sum of three disks. You can work that out. Um, a disk half mr squared, so I've got one of those, two of those. And the thickness of the disk doesn't matter because that is sort of included in the total mass, right? If those have the same mass, then that takes into account that this one might be thicker. If it didn't, then it might be more. If it had less mass, say, it would be more narrow. So the thickness as a whole doesn't matter because we're given the information of, about how much stuff that is in total making up the disk based on the mass that we're given. Um, that's going to be equal to that and then I this time I want my answer in terms of omega I don't care about the actual speed of the thing as it goes down so I'm going to use v is omega times big R or little r well the string is wrapped around this thing here so it's going to be little r but the calculation for i is going to include both little r and big R because they're disks of both sizes. Um, so I get that mgl is equal to one half i omega squared plus one half m r squared omega squared um, and I just rearrange for omega. Omega is going to be um, 2 mgl divided by i plus mr squared. Indeed, the units here work out. Well, mr squared has the same units as i. I'm going to take the square root of the whole thing. You can plug in values if you have values. Maybe you have a yo-yo. You can sort of estimate what the values are and see what you get. And if you want to be really fancy, you can try taking a video of your yo-yo as it goes down and you can measure just by looking at the frames, looking at it frame by frame or in some video editor, you can then measure its omega. You can check if this actually works out. It's a nice little mini lab that you can do at home. Um, but also, as I said, you can solve the problem of what is the angular acceleration of this or the, the linear acceleration downwards. That's a torque um, problem. So some examples here. I hope that helped. Rotational kinetic energy works just like normal kinetic energy. The point is it's called the sum of all the energies is conserved. So it allows you to solve problems such as this one. The next lecture we're going to move on to angular momentum, which gives us another conservation law, much like linear momentum. So once we look at angular momentum in, in three dimensions, things become very, very interesting. But at least you'll finally learn why riding a bike is easier when you're going fast. All right, see you in class. Good luck with your studies.